and is going to focus on the new re regional human development report published by UNDP on Latin America. Uh, this report focuses on the vicious cycle of low economic growth and high inequality experienced in Latin America over the last decades. Uh, of course, this is not a new topic, and it's an issue that's been grappled with both with academia and policy. However, what's interesting is that this report focused on ways of breaking some of the factors that may reinforce both the reproduction of this connection between low growth and, and high inequality. Um, to talk about these findings, we have lined up a very uh, uh, impressive panel, uh, if I may say so. Um, first up, we, to talk about the report, we'll have uh, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva. Uh, Luis Felipe is Assistant Secretary General uh, and UNDP Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, he's been working uh, for UNDP for quite some time and he worked before for the World Bank as well, where he co-directed and led the World Development Report in 2010. Um, and I have very good, very fond memories of that time. I was heavily involved in that report too. Um, sadly, Luis Felipe uh, had to, uh, was called to an urgent trip this morning, so he's unable to join us in person. Uh, however, he was kind enough to send us a pre-recorded intervention, uh, and he'll talk about the results. So we'll listen to that shortly. Then, uh, to respond to the results, we have uh, Carlos uh, Gadi. Carlos is a research fellow here at UN Wider, and he's on leave as Professor of Applied Economics at the University of Vigo in Spain. Um, Carlos is, has a PhD in, in economics from Barcelona, and he's worked for many, many years on issues around poverty and inequality. And he, at UNU either, he leads the WID database, the World Income Inequality Database. And then after Carlos, we will have um, some brief comments from Marcela Melendez. Uh, Marcela has kindly agreed to step in and represent UNDP. Uh, she's the sh Chief Economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at UNDP. She has a PhD in economics from Yale University, and she studied at Universidad de Los Andes in Colombia, which is a place very close to my own heart. Uh, and Marcela will um, uh, talk a little bit more about the, some of the findings, at, and, and hopefully also, uh, has, she also has kindly agreed to take some of the Q&A um, uh, at the end of the questions at the end of the presentations. So without further ado, um, welcome everyone. And uh, if we'll start then with the pre-recording uh, intervention by Luis Felipe. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I, I really want to um, express our gratitude to uh, Wider, uh, to Kunal Sen for this invitation, and uh, to Carlos Gradin with whom we have uh, for a long time discussed these issues related to inequality. This is a great opportunity uh, for me and for, for UNDP to join forces with, uh, with wider, particularly for the Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean at UNDP. And um, as um, we agreed uh, with Kunal and Carlos um, uh, when I was invited, I will discuss issues related to the broader theme of inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean, but I'm going to refer uh, specifically to the recent uh, human development report that was prepared and launched a few months ago uh, in our region and was led by Marcela Melendez uh, and an excellent team of, of researchers. Uh, Marcela is the chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean uh, here at UNDP. Uh, 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 so it's, it, she's going to be here to, to respond to the questions uh, after my presentation. Um, there were some logistics issues uh, for the presentation, but we really wanted to uh, stick to this, uh, to, to, to this date and time because so we know that there is a lot of interest in this topic. And I really hope that this will be the first of many interactions that we have with, uh, with you on this, on this topic. Um, as you very well know, we're already planning to, to have some uh, joint endeavors that will for sure enrich uh, this conversation. So thank you to, uh, uh, to you for inviting us and thank you to all of you who are joining uh, this, uh, this presentation. So again, it's not a strictly speaking the presentation of our regional report, but I will, ref I will be referring uh, throughout my presentation 
to uh, many of the uh, uh, elements that we go um, in depth um, in the in the report. So the most important element here is uh, when we talk about Latin America, we talk about two uh, structural issues in the region, depending to whom you talk to, uh, they will emphasize either the fact that the region is a very high inequality uh, region in the world, uh, but also uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the growth cycles of the region are pretty much linked to commodity booms and busts. And the idea is uh, that in general, there is uh, uh, the notion that it's a region with uh, low productivity growth and mediocre growth. So what we do in the report is to try to link these two aspects and try to show the, uh, the channels through which these phenomena um, uh, reinforce each other. And that's why, that is why we call it this trap of uh, low growth and high inequality. And then we show other manifestations or other implications of this trap uh, for the region. So what we know first is that we have uh, a region with uh, mediocre growth. If we compare the growth of Latin America and the Caribbean with other regions, we clearly see that we are certainly not among the best performers and actually we have a pretty uh, poor uh, performance in terms of economic growth as a region. And if we look at the specific countries, even the countries that have uh, been more successful in our region like uh, Chile, uh, Uruguay, or, or, or Panama. I'm talking, of course, the, uh, of course, uh, pre-pandemic, um, and that actually managed to get out of the uh, middle-income trap. Uh, do uh, underperform compared to the, the, the you know the fastest-growing economies uh, in in the in the globe. So we have um, a problem of low growth, but not only that, also uh, as we show in the report, the growth is also very volatile. So um, in a way also that volatility is linked to the, to, the, to the mediocre longer term performance in terms of economic growth. If we look at the number of years with uh, negative growth uh, in, a, in our region uh, by country, we see that Argentina leads with 17 uh, uh, years of negative growth since 1980. This is until uh, 2019. Of course, if you want to add 2020, you just have to add one year to each of these numbers because all the countries uh, uh, suffered a contraction during, during, um, during the pandemic. But you see that Colombia, the most resilient uh, economy in the region, all the way to Argentina, but overall, the region uh, has a higher number on average uh, of uh, uh, negative uh, growth years uh, compared to, to, to the standard. Rather than, than the average, what I mean is actually that many countries have a higher number of negative growth uh, with respect to, to the benchmark that would be the USA in this case. If we look at the, we decompose the determinants of, of, of growth in the region and we look at, you know, factor accumulation versus productivity, uh, we see that the main issue with the region indeed is low growth of productivity. Um, we all know that uh, old um, statement by, by Paul Krugman, who said that in the long term, productivity is not everything, but it's almost everything. Uh, so there is a serious concern with regards to uh, the low productivity growth in our region. On the other hand, we have very high and persistent inequality, persistent inequality. You know, Carlos, uh, you have discussed this in, in your work. And uh, we know that Latin America has structurally high inequality. Um, and uh, even though there was a reduction in income inequality as measured by the Gini index, uh, in household surveys, not corrected for, um, a, you know, the, the underestimation of, of income at the top. Uh, and you know that we, we uh, published this with Nora, Lust uh, Nora Lustig in uh, 2010 uh, to analyze the, the, the determinants of this pro uh, inequality reduction, mainly driven by a, a, a reduction in the, in the skills premium uh, and complemented by uh, a 
better incidence of public spending, mainly due to uh, conditional cash transfers. But um, the, the, the largest share of this reduction was driven by labor markets, uh, basically a compression of the, of the um, skill premium or the, the gap sort of between high skill versus low skill wages. So this is a fact, but, uh, but then in 2014 or so, this flattens uh, again and, and it gets stuck at a relatively high level. So even though there is a reduction, we were still stabilized again at a, at a very high level of inequality. So there is this, um, if we control by either human development index or GDP per capita, we see that Latin America has what some uh, papers called excess inequality, right? So um, the expected level of inequality given the level of development should be lower, is lower, but actually you observe higher levels of inequality. If you look at perceptions, which are, of course, we uh, there is a full chapter in which uh, in the report we go in depth into these perceptions, but what we can see is that there is a mismatch between what we actually measure in terms of, of uh, a, the, the, the shape of the distribution versus what people think about what the distribution is and certainly what people would like the distribution to be. And uh, also if you ask people, they will certainly tell you that they consider the uh, situation in, in their countries as being unfair in terms of um, different access to, to services and so on. So this uh, uh, inequality affects perceptions and these perceptions are also linked to the idea of, of uh, the reduction in trust in institutions because people think that as expressed by Latino Barometer in a, a new wave that we um, jointly, uh, for which we jointly prepared a specific module with, with uh, a Latino Barometer at UNDP, uh, we see that high share of the population in our region consider that uh, the system, uh, that the countries are governed um, with a bias to benefit certain groups in society. So if you link that to actually objectively the manifestations of that uh, you know, mis malfunctioning of the system or malfunction of the system, uh, we see that uh, one element in which the undue influence, undue influence of certain groups that have a, that affect or distort public policy, uh, is manifested, for example, in market power. So the, the idea that we have highly concentrated markets in certain sectors, and that generates generates um, a rents that are beyond what a normal uh, a return to capital would, would, uh, would allow. So basically the idea that uh, in, in one chapter in which there is a very, very detailed empirical work with very specific uh, uh, data uh, for many countries um, that uh, show that the estimates of the markup um, uh, uh, show that Latin America has uh, unusually high markups historically. So even in, in OECD countries where there is concern about the reduction in competition in certain sectors and the increase in the markups, uh, we see that uh, Latin America has persistently ha uh, showed very high markups. And uh, we also see a few big firms that have a lot of power in the markets and many uh, very small firms a large share of the of the of the labor in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean is actually in firms that have five workers or less, and another uh, high share is in self-employed. So if you add those two, you have that most of the labor in our region is actually either very small firms or self-employed. So in that sense, um, uh, that is, it's also a structural characteristic that we, we, we analyze and uh, that is systematically generating this um, appropriation of rents by large firms in markets that are uh, less competitive. In addition to this, and to close this, um, this picture of the persistence of inequality, we see that um, the redistribution capacity of the state in Latin America and the Caribbean is relatively low if you take uh, perhaps uh, uh, 
Argentina, which the, the issues related to the sustainability of that redistribution that we have seen recently. Uh, but there was, a, as you know, a, a, a large increase in public spending in the last, uh, uh, in, in, well, I will say in the last, but between 2002, 2015. Uh, you see Uruguay that has a higher level of redistribution compared to the rest of the region, particularly after the fiscal reform of 2007. But in general, countries in Latin America have very small reduction of the Gini in this index uh, before and after redistribution, uh, before and after taxes and spending. So in that sense, the redistribution capacity of the state uh, is not there to, to compensate for the inequality we, we saw before. So in that sense, all these um, reinforces, these patterns re reinforce each other. And as, as I said, if you go to the report, you will see how um, these are linked. And I will mention a few elements of this uh, in a minute, but also the other characteristics of, of, characteristic of our region is related to, uh, to violence. So, so we have 99 percent of the population in the world, and one third of the homicides uh, in the planet. So that means that we're way overrepresented as a region uh, in terms of violent uh, deaths, uh, and and that's a, a structural characteristic that, as we show in the report, for example, the links to inequality. Well, the the high levels of of violence. Uh, uh, affect, for example, investment in human capital, uh, affect disproportionately the poorest, but at the same time also uh, inequality, uh, controlling for many other aspects has a marginal impact uh, in the, uh, uh, in, um, um, in, in violence, uh, on violence, sorry. So there is a very, very detailed study that shows that uh, um, inequality per se, while not being the only cause, has historically been a driver of, of violence uh, in, in our region. So that is this excess violence, as we, we can also call it, that when you control for the level of inequality, that explains a good deal of, 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 uh, of the victimization rate, but there are other determinants that make this uh, uh, victimization rate even higher of what you would expect. So there are systemic issues that make this uh, uh, violence uh, as a way to sort of enforce contracts uh, in our region and that uh, rep reproduces the level of, of high inequality because it, it disproportionately affects the poorest, but also affects investments that could increase productivity. So in a way it relates to the whole trap. So uh, one particular element of inequality that is discussed in the report is uh, intimate partner violence. We see that not only historically, and we show that, but also because of the COVID crisis that has been an increase, but that is not COVID crisis, COVID pandemic is not the cause of this. This is a structural element in our society that uh, really is, is really concerning in terms of, of public policy, uh, how to make uh, the household uh, really the safest uh, place for women to be, which is not the case at this, uh, unfortunately, today. So uh, related to this is, is uh, as I mentioned before, the idea that we have very small firms and typically informal, uh, uh, informal workers. So there has been a lot of um, discussion on informality, particularly, I would say, uh, I was looking recently to a, to a uh, work done by, by ECLAC, and it's mainly about how to measure informality, but there is not much about the economics of informality. So I think what we in, in the report bring to the conversation is really a, a, a deep uh, understanding of the economics of informality as an outcome of different aspects related to environment and policy that interact to, to lead to this very limited uh, uh, space for firms to grow. And uh, then informality as a characteristic, as a structural characteristic of the labor, of the labor market uh, that leaves people either unprotected or, uh, or protected through mechanisms that, that uh, uh, we will show in a minute could, could be distorting. So this informality has led 
to policy responses, which by the way, uh, ILO shows that the pandemic may have an effect even in increasing even further the levels of inequality. It is very important uh, to say that um, this informality leads to policy responses that, that as, uh, as um, we show in the report based on work by Santiago Levy that you may know from the past, but now we, we do it for a, a, a set of countries to try to understand what is the structure in terms of institutional fiscal environment that, le that leads to that outcome of inequality that uh, uh, we show then that how these policy responses may actually be distorting even further and creating more uh, um, informality, lower productivity and higher inequality. So our approach is basically that these two aspects, low growth and high inequality are self-reinforcing what we call the trap and that it le uh, leads to perceptions of inequality and unfairness that are very clear that is manifested in terms of concentration of power, which is another chapter of the report for which I will show you a few numbers uh, just recently, and then create violence as a mechanism to uh, either uh, as an exit uh, from the social contract or as a way to enforce contracts. Um, and uh, we see how the policy responses that try to deal with this issue of high inequality and low productivity end up uh, uh, reinforcing the pattern. So at the end, it's an issue related to, to governance. And when we talk about the, the governance, what do we mean? Well, we mean basically agreements among actors that decide on rules and policies. So there is this policy arena that uh, which uh, determines what policies will be implemented. And that leads to outcomes that as we show you, as I just showed you, in this case, mediocre growth, high inequality, high vulnerability, high levels of conflict. No, not conflict, but violence as a way to process conflict. That redistributes the fact of power. So uh, that gives more capacity to certain, for certain groups to influence that policy arena. So the policy arena leads to, again, policies that reinforce that pattern. But that policy arena also, our arena also determines the rules. So sometimes actually the rules of the game are also uh, distorted in a way that uh, the, the jury power is distributed. So that inf infinity loop, as we call it uh, in the WDR 2017 of governance is systematically reinforcing the pattern that we observe here in terms of the outcomes. Mediocre growth, high inequality as a self reinforcing pattern related to this de facto and the jury power manifested in this policy arena, which is where these power asymmetries are manifested. So we need to discuss with, which can, how we change that in terms of what policies we have to design in a different way, which rules or, uh, ideally would have to change to lead to different outcomes. And in order to, to, to be able to do this, we need to create new coalitions of actors. Because of course, uh, in order for the political economy of this, uh, to lead to changes, we need to rebalance those power asymmetries by, the, by creating these um, new coalitions of actors. So basically the idea is these three areas to strengthen effective governance or to create what we can call a renewed or, or strengthened social contract, which involves new policies, new, game, uh, new rules of the game and new actors in that policy arena. So one proposal I want to uh, emphasize, which is something we uh, really go in depth in the, in the report uh, among others, but I want to emphasize this one is social protection as a key entry point to change the dynamics of this process. So first, as I said, there is very high level of informality, but informality is not the cause of the problem. Informality is already the symptom of a systemic uh, a aspect a, a element in the in the in the economy, the labor markets that leads to that informality as an outcome, right? The environment, as I said, institutional environment, fiscal, social uh, protection that leads. Main one of the main elements, not the only one, but one of the main elements, is a strict link between access to formal social protection and the type of job 
that people have. So one essential element here is how to delink the job status from the, the social protection. And, and that's why we call for a different way to think about uh, uh, social protection. The idea is first to differentiate very clearly between those things that are social insurance and are related indeed to, uh, uh, to, to work and to the type of job that people have. And there is social assistance, which has to do with whether people are poor or non-poor in terms of their capacity to generate income structurally. So in that sense, uh, what we have done uh, is that we get confused between these two things. And for example, you can have many social programs in our region, and we've of course show that for several countries in which one characteristic to be able to access programs for poverty alleviation depend on people not having a formal job. Whereas these two elements are, are different. One thing is to be poor or non-poor, and a different thing is to be formal or informal. So the idea is, uh, how do we start delinking these, these two things? So first aspect is, let's go for social protection that is truly universal in the sense delinked from uh, job status. And we create a basic package of social protection that, I, that is available to everybody, financed through general taxes in a way that is, of course, is explained in the report. And it will depend on each context, how you do it. Second is that it's truly uh, inclusive in the sense that it's not only universal uh, the jury, but actually universal de facto, how to really bring all those who were excluded from the social protection in the past. Very important is this element of being growth friendly. That means that is uh, associated with incentives for employment creation, incentives for firm growth, and not uh, in a way that is distortive uh, uh, and, and distorts uh, the environment in a way that leads to poor uh, uh, productivity growth and, and, and then to, to uh, low growth. So social protection has also uh, needs to be also growth friendly. And of course, it has to be fiscally sustainable. Otherwise, it could lead to this um, cyclical uh, contractions or crisis because we typically end up increasing public spending and eventually uh, collapsing because of the fiscal uh, uh, unsustainability that is created. So basically then the social protection that we go um, in detail in the report about how to make it universal, inclusive, growth friendly, fiscally sustainable, that could be one entry point to try to start changing the dynamics of the whole, um, of the whole system and try to uh, then create uh, a different dynamics uh, of higher growth and lower inequality. So this is the proposal that we have in the report. Um, I'm sure you can, um, uh, I mean, you, you will have comments on the way uh, uh, we propose, but the idea is precisely to, to go in that direction. And we're trying to now start to have, you know, start having specific conversation in every context with our teams to try to see what really mean, what it really means in terms of um, the, the changes. Again, I insist in terms of rules, in terms of policies, and who are the actors that can bring to, uh, we can bring to, to the table to support these changes in order to try to revert this and really address these characteristics from their structural causes and not only trying to respond with short-term uh, uh, policies. So I, I know it's, it has been a very succinct and, and very general uh, presentation of ideas that are uh, uh, more, much deeper, but uh, Marcela will be uh, here. She led uh, the work with the team to go into the details and different chapters. She can uh, be here to also answer your, your questions. But uh, as I said, I hope this is the first of a series of conversations and collaboration with, uh, with uh, wider uh, thank you again for the invitation, and it has been a pleasure to 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 uh, present this to you. Okay, well, that was uh, a great overview of the report, and uh, uh, now I uh, pass uh, the floor to Carlos, who's going to have a response to it. And in the meantime, anyone who has questions, please do add them to the chat box. Carlos. Uh, thank you, Patricia. I would like to. Thank Luis Felipe for the presentation of this uh, very rich and important report on inequality in the Latin American 
region. Uh, Luis Felipe, who I, as he mentioned, I uh, had the opportunity to, dis to, to meet and discuss with him uh, issues around inequality, polarization a long time ago. And I would like to thank also Wider for um, allowing me to um, participate in this, in this discussion. I'm gonna share the slides. Can you see it? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, so the starting point of the report is that uh, the region has been successful in substantially reducing poverty in recent decades and improving the access to basic services as this was detailed in the 2019 um, Human Development Report. But however, it has been less successful in combating uh, inequalities in general. There was substantial reduction in income inequality in the decade of the 2000s, but this was limited if compared with the large initial levels and has stalled, if not reversed, uh, more recently. As a result, and this is the main message of the report, the region is in a development trap with slow and volatile economic growth combined with high income inequality. To put this in context, I couldn't help to use the World Income Inequality Database, WID, that we host at Uno Wider, with um, standardized information on the income distribution all over the world. So we can see here, for example, that growth in per capita income in the region followed the world's trend until recently, when it seems to lose track. But this, as mentioned also by Luis Felipe, is in contrast with the impressive trend shown by East Asia and the Pacific over the same period. In terms of inequality as measured by the Gini index or the Gini coefficient, but replicated by other inequality measures, the unweighted average across countries has shown a substantial decline, but the curve has been flattened more recently and the level remains persistently high. Especially if compared with other world regions, it's similar, for example, to uh, South Asia and below the level of Sub-Saharan Africa, when these regions are compared using income instead of consumption, which is the usual case, but still above the world average and above most other regions. If countries are weighted by their population, reflecting the average experience of Latin American people, the, the trend in recent years is similar. The reduction is larger because it reflects the strong declines in inequality in the largest countries like Brazil, Mexico, or Argentina. The situation doesn't change much if we measure inequality among all citizens in the world, also in the region, uh, regardless of the country where they live, given that inequality between countries does not seem to change much over time. To fight inequality, it's important to understand why inequality decline or increase. The report, based on previous research by UNDP, by Luis Felipe, or by um, uh, Nora Lustig, points out the fact that inequality declined by a combination of factors, including large economic growth, creating opportunities, a reduction in returns to higher education that narrowed the skill and skill wage gap, and redistribution via cash transfers, with institutional factors like labor unions or minimum wage also playing a role in some cases. An important strand of the literature of earnings inequality has recently raised the question about the importance of considering the nature of tasks that workers, that workers perform, not only their skills. So recent developments in the US and other industrialized countries point to an important role played by changes in the demanded tasks due to technical progress or international trade. In this scenario, the press demand for workers in routine tasks middle income jobs it can now be executed by computer technology. This would result in polarization in either earnings or in employment or both. So exhibiting stronger growth of employment and earnings at both extremes and hollowing out the middle of the earnings distribution. However, most of this literature has focused on developed countries. And we know very little about the effects of this process on earnings inequality in developing countries. And for the reason, 
you know, wider in association with UCT and IBS launched a cross country project in 2019 with a focus on countries in the global south. The project engaged with 11 country studies all over the global south with Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Peru in the Latin American region. Among the main findings, of course, we find that among, uh, uh, we find that it's clear that the, the key role of the expansion of education of workers, mainly secondary and tertiary, in the case of Latin America, pushing the skill premium down uh, when it's not matched by the demand, therefore contributing to lower inequality. But we also observe a transformation, an important transformation in the composition of the workforce in Latin American economies that deserve being considered. Uh, with a trend no exempt of rebounds in recent years to increase workers in high skill, less routine jobs, mainly in the service sector, often in paid uh, and formal employment. And this came at the expense of uh, elementary occupations in formal self-employment in agriculture and manufacturing sectors. However, we found weak or mixed evidence of polarization in either employment or earnings, with exceptions in recent years in Brazil and Argentina, but with no clear connection with the task approach. This seems to be more related with the conventional pro poor pro rich growth associated with skills than the following, the hollowing out of uh, the middle, which is more associated with uh, tasks. So earnings inequality is mainly driven by changes in earnings structure. So as opposed to automatic effect of changes in the workforce composition, Occupations are important, but we can say that inequality occurs mainly within occupations, not between them, with the exception of Chile. And this seems to be intensified over time. There is a general tendency to observe that uh, higher earnings in less routine occupations, particularly in Brazil, but there is no clear evidence of changes in the returns to these routine tasks explaining the observed trends in inequality in the region. And regardless of the direction of overall trend inequality increasing or declining, there is a clear disequalizing effect of having a more educated workforce when returns to education are kept uh, constant. What has been called the paradox of progress. And for example, it's important to explain recent increasing inequality in Brazil. So the report also highlights the existence of important horizontal inequalities in the region by ethnicity or by gender alongside this vertical inequalities, as well as the important importance of uh, people perceiving these inequalities as being excessive and unfair, which relates both to outcomes and processes. There is a perception of, in a reality, of uh, excessive concentration of power in elite capture, and the report analyzes the effects of market power, both in business and trade unions on, on inequality. Just to mention a, a striking example, it's, it's striking to see that people perceive, for example, inequality being more inequality or this being more unfair in countries like Costa Rica or Uruguay than they do in Nicaragua or El Salvador. It would lead to the discussion of role of aspirations or poverty or social stratification in shaping these uh, perceptions of inequality which is discussed in the report, but I think it's opening also new areas that need to be further investigated. The report, uh, the subject is perceptions described in the report also help to shape higher demands for a distribution. And these higher demands face a reality of a weak, fragmented and dual welfare system, trapped in uh, large shares of informality and with societies prone to uh, experience various types of violence. So on summary, uh, the region is caught in an inequality trap. The situation of uh, high inequality can be aggravated by the consequences of the pandemic, in particular due to the digital divide, and also make harder to address crucial issues like uh, fighting climate change. But I think all these issues are highlighted in the report, but the report also discusses important exits, ways to uh, overcome with these uh, problems. And I think that's the main, the most important contribution of the report. So thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, and now uh, over to Marcella. Oh, Marcella, would you like to react to Carlos? Carlos' presentation while we wait for questions to come in from the audience. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Carlos, for reading the report and, and for uh, um, highlighting uh, some of its messages. I, I think probably I can use this, this little time to, to strengthen some of the messages and to, and to clarify. What, one of the things that we are looking into very carefully is the relationship between market structure and the distribution of income. We are uh, finding that and that's part of the story of the skill premium, but it's like a, an additional ingredient. We're finding that if we look at the distribution of uh, business sizes, including self-employment on the left tail, and compare it to the income distribution, the, the, the shape of these uh, distributions is very similar, and it's um, particular for the region as compared to, to uh, more advanced economies, to the US and Europe. When we look at the income distribution and take like just only workers, like personal income, the ratio between the uh, income received by, by people that are on the top of the distribution in the 90th percentile related to the person who is in the middle of the distribution is much higher in Latin America than in, in, than in the advanced economies. But what is very particular is that the distribution is much thicker on the lower tail. So we're saying we need to pay attention to that side too. There is a story ab about concentration of uh, business and concentration of sizes on one extreme that is similar to, to the one that we're talking about in Europe and in, in uh, the US. That, that is probably even more pronounced because ownership is more concentrated too, uh, in, the upper, in the upper side of the business distribution. But on the other extreme, we have something that is particular and different. When, when you look at like the, the dispersion, the relationship between the income of the poorest of the workers related to those in the middle, uh, the, then the distance in Latin America is much higher than in the rest. And, and so that, that connects to, I guess, two different stories that we're trying to, to, to um, bring, bring evidence to, because we think these are important conversations. Conversations. One of them uh, has to, do, of course, with uh, market power translating into business political power and reforms that do not happen uh, be because they are blocked by the like in the, the interest of, of particular groups. An example is a competition policy, for instance. Our countries lack working competition policies, competition agencies. Most of them in some countries, they, this type of institutions are non-existent, totally non-existent. And we are saying this, this is one of the tools that you have to somehow contain uh, power at the top. And uh, the fact that it doesn't exist or that it is weak has to do, uh, it's, not, it's not independent of that type of power. But on the other side, we have a the, a, a, an alternative explanation that comes through through the regulatory environment. And when you look at the regulatory environment and you look at social protection systems and you look at tax systems, and we're saying uh, we, we need to pay attention to how we are set up and we need to invest in productivity enhancement because we are finding evidence that there are factors, and this is like the, the, what is behind the story that we're telling, that there are factors that change a little bit the way we address productivity and uh, and equality uh, typically in, in our heads. The, the, we, we are saying these are not two competing avenues. There are things that are making us both uh, uh, highly unequal and uh, they're making us grow poorly and have low productivity. We are uh, giving a message that productivity enhancing policies may be inequality reducing and that, in, that inequality reducing policies maybe productivity enhancing. And one important, like that I've mentioned, like Luis Felipe extended himself uh, in talking about social protection uh, policies. But for instance, when we speak about violence, we are, uh, we've known and it's more established that there is a relationship between uh, inequality and violence and that, that, and that the relationship is even stronger than, than, than it is and more robust 
than it is with poverty, but we're also making a case that it goes the other way around, that violence is making us more unequal when it, like, when it starts lands in, in, a, in a level playing field and, and that it's like uh, making, like hurting people's welfare, but it's all, not, not only that, but it's also uh, impeding the capi human capital accumulation and it's deviating resources that could go into development and that are, that are instead going into security, big security expenses and things that, that countries have to spend in. Uh, and it's deviating um, private investment and distorting decisions that, that private investors. So we are trying to look at things that, that change the story and I will close with that in the sense that uh, we are saying, listen, th there are some things that are particular to the region that, are, that make the region different to others that uh, if we address properly, could probably move the region in the correct direction on both fronts. Thank you so much, Marcella. And yeah, very good points made there. And maybe I'll pick up on them um, a bit later. But first, we have a few questions coming in. Uh, so let me just open up to everyone. Um, we have a question from Ricardo Santos, who's uh, in the UNUI office in Maputo. Ricardo, do you want to um, just ask your question live? Then we can unmute you. I'm not sure the technology is there, but. Um, Hello. Yep, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Hi, so first of all, thank you so much for creating this opportunity and even if, uh, well, remotely or virtually, thanking for the, the presentation that was really, really interesting. And Marcelo, please convey that. Um, my question is, uh, looking into the presentation, one, one question that came to me was, um, so what is it known of the role of group inequalities in Latin America and the persistence of the income inequality? Uh, so research that uh, we've conducted on Brazil, looking at the period of inequality reduction that happened under the Workers' Party governments, that research indicates that it is possible to reduce both vertical and group inequalities, but then it may be the case that such initiatives are not easy to sustain politically and maybe even socially. Um, so what is it known in other Latin American countries and in uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil? Over. Thank you, Ricardo. Maybe Marcella, would you like to take that one? And Carlos, if you have anything to add, please do. Horizontal inequalities. I'm, I'm glad that you bring that to the to the table because we like they are another phase of inequality in in Latin America, and uh, I think the way. A forward to reduce a group a group inequality is different than the one like uh, that that we would need to to work with to to solve income inequality. When 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 I think about monetary inequalities, it's impossible not to think about fiscal systems, how we uh, tax people and how we spend, and that alone uh, very uh, very hardly will help us uh, bring, uh, for instance, equality in uh, political agency and political participation of ethnic minorities or um, uh, level the playing field for women in the labor markets or uh, improve the class divide. Some of our, some of our, our countries are, uh, so our societies are horribly classist uh, and segregated. Uh, we don't, we, we sort of, we try to lay out the facts and, and show how these are uh, ways in which, in which inequality is, pervades uh, still many of our countries. We don't have, and the report doesn't have any sort of, it's not meant to have any policy prescriptions in order to, to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to tell countries how to go about this, but it tries to give some uh, general lines of, of action and it really depends on the group. But when, when we think about uh, group inequalities, I, I think a conversation that is very important is uh, political participation and how you open avenues 
at the local levels for people and groups that have like vulnerable groups that lack a political voice to start participating. And so uh, recovering or transiting towards uh, better working democracies and or, or uh, spaces where people can participate. I think it's, it would be part of the solution. I am, I don't have the answer, uh, the, the, the magic answer as to how to do that, but I think that's one of the uh, ways. And um, I think we have to do a lot of pedagogy, no? With respect to, uh, for instance, uh, inequality suffered by LGBTI plus groups. There's a, a lot, uh, th these are people who are discriminated in um, many of dimensions of their lives and are also a group that is particularly target of violence. And there is a, a, a lot of, um, I guess, um, misunderstanding in terms of uh, uh, what makes us different or equal, things that we have embedded in our heads. And I think it has, like, it, this applies to when we think about gender roles, the, these gender biases and, and biases that we're brought up with and that we uh, very often do not, like, realize and come to face unless somebody else points them out or some, something particular happens close to us that points them out. So there is a, a, a great challenge in terms of uh, communicating uh, and reaching, I, I guess, uh, households inside so that there can be transformations. I don't have better answers. We don't look particularly at Brazil. We don't look particularly at any country because we are looking at the, a regional level, but we are, I think, uh, bringing a voice that speaks closely to things that we, that we see in all of the countries of the, of the region. Carlos, would you... Have any comments to add? No, yeah, I think uh, Ricardo points out a very important point, no? that is the need to align the fight against vertical and horizontal, horizontal mm -hmm. inequalities. No? Because I think there are contexts in which vertical inequalities are reduced because the cycle, uh, uh, the expansion of social transfers and the economic cycle are favorable, but that is not enough to reduce some oh, yeah. horizontal inequalities, especially when they are very uh, well rooted in, in the structure of the country, no? and I think, for example, in, uh, some gender inequalities or inequalities against um, indigenous populations in Brazil, you need like being more proactive to make sure that the reduction of inequality uh, involves also these uh, most excluded groups, especially when they are uh, very poor or located in specific uh, or remote areas, etc. No? For example, in the case of Brazil, I think the, the access to education, measures to improve the access of education of black people or indigenous or the uh, protection of uh, uh, indigenous populations, lands, etc., uh, are very important to, to make sure the reduction of inequality benefited these people. And now we are like in the opposite situation. The cycle, the general cycle goes against reducing inequalities because of the change in the economic uh, cycle, but also the changes in uh, social transfer, but also the hostile environment towards protecting these groups you know, and, and, and reducing the, the, the small protection they, they were building around and protecting them. And, and, and then you will move from a virtuous uh, cycle to, a, uh, to the opposite. You know? Thanks, Carlos. We have a question here from Donna Dan. So I don't know, Donna, do you want to ask a question to the audience? Yeah? Yes. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, where you are. Um, thank you very much to all the presenters for such a wonderful um, presentation, so informative. Um, first, I want to ask if the recording will be made available. And secondly, my question was, what information do you have on the Anglo-Caribbean? Um, and if you do have information on inequality and poverty, um, is the phenomenon similar, is it similar or dissimilar to the Latin American countries. And I guess um, some focus should be on the Anglo-Caribbean country, um, Caribbean countries in general, because of the natural disasters and the seemingly increasing nat um, nat natural disasters that they're having. And I'm sure it's affecting the vulnerable groups very much and maybe pushing them further down the ladder. Um, so that's my question or comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Marcelo, perhaps again. Yeah, from, yeah from, the, from the information available, 
we know that some of the Caribbean countries are among the more unequal in the world. The Caribbean looks like even more a, a, unequal than, than Latin America. I don't know if you remember that graph that Luis Felipe showed. And so it's not, it, it, there, there is heterogeneity, but I, I, I should say the following. We, we tried as much as we could to bring the, uh, the Anglo-Caribbean into the report. There is a, a huge lack of good data. So um, household surveys and censuses are not uh, systematically done over time. Some of the like information is a bit outdated. There's a lot of like it's a, there's a big data challenge for the Caribbean, and it's very uneven across countries. So this is why we cannot like uh, explore further uh, things in the Caribbean. We are looking now carefully within UNDP in in, in my office at uh, countries that do have um, household surveys, even if they are not as as frequent as in other countries. But that basically the story of the Caribbean in terms of inequality is is similar and perhaps even more complicated as you were rightly pointing so to extend that this is a region that is extremely exposed to to phenomena from climate change and 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 through devastation that happens recurrently uh, we we brought i don't know it's not it's not part of the caribbean but we are trying to look also at haiti which is a, a particular country in the in the region and and i think it's like a a big pain in the region. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcella. Now I have a question, and I thought it was really interesting that this report touches upon the violence issue, which is not common, right? And um, but from what I understand, it's mostly data on homicides. But obviously, you know, Latin America has had very long-running conflicts, including Colombia, and. Uh, I am really, I was really pleased to see this link running from conflicts to inequality, uh, which we did focus the opposite direction, but actually in these long run conflicts, this is going to be the case and there's going to be several people also, uh, which are going to be affected differently. Uh, say poor farmers uh, in Colombia, poor farmers in, in Peru have been heavily affected. And then there's the whole issue of urban violence in, in Central America and so forth. But the, the, the issue that makes it really complicated is sometimes some of these policies that get put in place, like even the cash transfer programs, for instance, lead into more tensions and social tensions and conflicts. We saw a rise in protests, for instance, as well, which was kind of a backlash against the lack of middle class involvement in some of these programs. How, where do you see, Marcella, how, how can we disentangle these really complex knot, knots of armed conflict, protests, social tensions, uh, urban violence, and then not also social policies having the beneficial effects that we might expect? Uh, I, wish, I wish I had the answer to that question, but let, let me uh, say this, that the report looks at much more than homicides. The thing is that a quantitative work that can be done basically uses the data that, that, that exists. So they are like, you, you know that data better than, than myself, but like it's basically homicides and some uh, uh, victimization rates. No. So there is also a huge lack of data to explore at a, a, more, uh, at a deeper level uh, what goes on in each of our countries. However, uh, one of the background papers of the report by Anna Arjona looks like did, did a wonderful, I'd say a, a, a literary a lit review with a purpose, looking very carefully at all of what we can collect. And uh, she's looking like, we, we, we're basically understanding that we are the most violent region in the world, but uh, the type of violence that is uh, present in each country is not necessarily the same and intensity varies across countries. And we're looking at social, political and criminal violence. And we are talking about the violence coming from a trade of illicits. This is like, we, you cannot talk about violence in Latin America without talk, talking about difficult issues. So there is, I guess, one strand of violence that has to do with this um, social unrest and unhappiness and, and uh, 
as, as Luis Felipe was saying, like an exit mechanism uh, when you uh, don't feel that your voice is, is being heard. But there is also these other sources of violence that are so, so complicated. Um, when, when you look at policy and the impact of transfers, I guess, I guess that the big challenge is to understand how they fall into uh, spaces that are not empty in the sense that there are a lot of, I, I hate to say this because I sound very much like an economist, but I am, but they, they, they don't look at, at, at how they can distort incentives. So you do things with the best intentions and sometimes put in play, uh, policies in place with the best intentions without realizing how people might respond. Uh, and, and, and desirable result, result, for instance, of, of uh, conditional cash transfers that has been documented is the increase in, in pregnancies of, of young women uh, in, in order to be able to claim the transfer. So that's, you, you need to like, uh, I guess, uh, be aware of, of what uh, can go wrong. I would still defend cash transfers and monetary uh, and, and conditional cash cash transfers as not the 100% of social protection, as one of the pillars of so social protection, as what they are meant to be. No? This type of policy that is there to really prevent people from falling into poverty and to uh, come to a rescue in moments of shock, like the one that we have been living. The, the thing is that we cannot expect uh, on transferences alone to eradicate poverty. And this is why we are trying to shift the emphasis on, to, to look at the other pillar of social protection that is very broken and doesn't work well in Latin America, that, the, the pillar of social, of social insurance. These are two things that should be complementary and not substitutes in a social protection system that works well. Um, the, well the developed world, everyone in the developed world, everyone in the world needs to have a, some sort of protection against the risks that we all face without being poor health risks, longevity, uh, discapacity. So, so this is why we're saying, listen, we have to rethink how we build this because one of the strands, one of the pillars hasn't, was, wasn't able to respond during the pandemic. Uh, and there is a lot of mismatch in terms of the incentives from the pillar of transfer, uh, transferences and the pillar from social insurance that are making us be so informal and that may, are making, are contributing to uh, having these uh, labor markets with so many people working on their own as self-employed or in very tiny businesses, which go against both their own livelihoods in terms of the income that they can make, but that also hurt the, the way our countries grow because these are very low productivity businesses. Thank you. I really like the, this conceptual framework around two pillars. I, I think that's, it's really interesting. And I wish we could explore more, but apparently we're three minutes over the time. So, um, Marcella, thank you so much for your kind of in joining us. Uh, I don't know if it last moment, but it was really appreciated that you could come and join us. And it's great meeting you. And perhaps uh, last words for Carlos before we uh, close the session. No, just uh, to thank you, Marcela and Luis Felipe and UNDP for this uh, great report. And I recommend to read it. If people are lazy to read the long version, they have the shortest version too. Indeed, I highly recommend it as well. Again, thank you. And thank you to Carlos as well and Marcela once more. And thank you for all the participants. And I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.